to talk about a new project I've been doing uh, for the last couple of weeks called uh, Hyperdrive. Like Sylvain said, I've been doing Node since 2008. Uh, I think it might be 2009. It was back when Node was 0 0.1. So like 80 major versions ago, I guess now. Um, I recently discovered that the first issue I ever reported on the Node issue tracker was a memory corruption bug uh, when using buffers. So I'm kind of glad we don't have them anymore because imagine having an object in JavaScript and it might change underneath you because the project you're using is insanely immature. Uh, but yeah, it's all better now. Cool. So I never used one of these things before. It's pretty awesome. Uh, anyways, so I work on a open source project called the Dead Project, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, data sharing tool uh, that's all open source. We are a three-person team, all full-time. We're funded by a nonprofit. So we all remote, we just do open source. We have a total of more than 750 modules on NPM, uh, three people. And uh, I mean, the total module count on NPM is increasing all the time, but last time I checked, it was around 200,000. Uh, so that means that there's around half a percentage chance that you're using it, uh, one of our modules. Uh, and there's a thousand people here, and that's like math I can't even do, but there's probably somebody in here who's using some of our stuff. So I think that's, that's pretty awesome. Yay, MPM, pretty awesome. Anyways, the thing I'm gonna talk to you about today is uh, it's a new peer-to-peer -peer thing I've been working on called Hyperdrive. And uh, Hyperdrive is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network that's completely written in JavaScript and uh, completely decentralized and that works in the browser and the node. I don't know if any of you in here ever use file sharing tools, but if you do, you probably have used uh, BitTorrent at some point. So BitTorrent is pretty cool because it's like the, the main cool project out there that has massive traction. Um, it's basically a network of peers all sharing the same data and you, instead of downloading data from a server, you just download it from peers instead. So that's pretty awesome. These are the three things. So I've been working with BitTorrent a lot and these are what the three things I wanted to fix in BitTorrent. That's why I wrote Hyperdrive. So I'm gonna get into them a little bit, but it's basically something I call smart diffing. So we'll get into that at some point. Something called deduplication. And the last one, which is really important to me, is trying to keep everything as simple as possible and as modular as possible. So kind of like try to increase that 750 module count as much as possible by doing independent tools. But let's try to dive into these a little bit. So smart diffing, it's, it's like the kind of word you just throw out there that nobody knows what it means, but it sounds cool. So that's why I put it up there. Uh, so it's basically trying to solve this problem. So let's say you, you have a file and um, you want to share this file, but in the future you might want to share a newer version of this file. Then it's really important that you can, can diff the two files and only sh share what uh, uh, isn't part of the first file. And the way you do this is usually you divide a file into chunks that are um, unlikely to change when you update a file. So what does that even mean? Well. Um, if you look at a tool we probably all use, uh, Git. Uh, Git is really good at this, so I'm gonna tell you how it does it, uh, because it's actually not that complicated. So here's the JavaScript slide, first one out of, uh, that's it. Um, so let's say you have some source code, right? And I wanna version it with Git. So what Git does is, it'll actually take a source code file and it'll divided into uh, lines. So we'll look for new lines in that file. And every time it finds a new line, it'll say, oh, everything between here and the previous new line is now a chunk in the file. Uh, because that's a really good way of dealing with source code because we usually put a new line when we're, uh, as I said, like a not natural atomic delimiter, right? So why is, this, why is this smart? Well, it's smart because of this thing. So let's say we update this function. So instead of doing uh, worlds here, and I hope this is correct, we put, Mond in there, Mond, Mond? I don't know how to pronounce that, but people keep speaking French to me, so I guess I would try. Um, so let's say you update like one line in this file um, and you chunk it again, right? The really cool thing is that now uh, three quarters of the file hasn't changed and we can detect that by just chunking it again and see that the chunks are the same as, the, the, as they were a minute ago. So that's really, really useful because that means that if we're only sharing a div, we now know that we only need to send like that one line. Um, there's only one problem. Uh, this only works for text files. And if you're building a file sharing network, 
it kind of sucks only being able to share text files, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, kind of want to be able to share any kind of data. So I was kind of bummed out about this for a while until a good friend of mine linked me a cool paper uh, that I tried to read but didn't understand, but then find the implementation up. So it's all good. Uh, it's called uh, Rabin fingerprinting. And I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly because I have no idea how to pronounce that also. Uh, so Rabin fingerprinting, what's that? Nobody knows. Well, something called content-defined chunking that also nobody knows. Uh, but I'll try to, to quickly explain that. So basically, it's a way, and it's using some cool math that I, I, I have actually, I studied math at university, so I should get it, but I don't because I'm not that good. Uh, but it uses some math based on something called irreducible polynomials to chunk a file based on the content. So actually, it's an algorithm that can scan through a file, and once in a while will admit, hey, here's a chunk. And that chunk is defined based on the content, content it's reading. Um, so it basically does like a sliding window or a file, and once in a while it says, like, here's a chunk, here's a chunk, here's a chunk, based on some parameters. And that's really cool because of this feature. So let's say you have a file, and you ran the Rabin chunker through it. And it looks at the content of the file and it decides, well, this file has five chunks, the blue, yellow, whatever that color is, and the other colors. Um, and says, these are the chunks, and the chunks are not guaranteed to be fixed sized, but you can kind of tweak this algorithm to emit sizes of a, uh, around a current size. So we do it around 20 kilobytes because that's usually a pretty good uh, size. So let's say you modify this file and inject a part in the middle, right? So the really cool thing about a Rabin chunker is that since it's, it's chunking based on the actual file content, if you run the chunker through it again, we'll figure out that the first chunk is the same because it's the same content. The second chunk is the same because it's also the same content. Whatever happened in the middle where we inserted that new piece, anything goes, but a worst case will only affect those two neighboring chunks. So if we're do dealing with 20 kilobyte chunks, we'll like in the worst case, only modify 60 kilobytes. So that's a really, really powerful feature uh, that's also very complex, but hopefully I'll get to show you in a minute why that's cool. So that's diffing. <laughs> uh, so deduplication. Deduplication is also one of those words that uh, I'm going to try to keep my beard out of the microphone because I heard some crunching in there. Uh, so deduplication is kind of cool because of uh, this. So what is it even? So deduplication is a feature where if you're building a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, and you're downloading a bunch of stuff, uh, you kind of only want to download a specific chunk once and you only want to store it once. You don't want to download the same content twice because that's stupid. Uh, so how do we even do that? So here's a really classic uh, real-world example, I think. So let's say you made a torrent ride but it's actually not a torrent, it's like a hyperdrive torrent. And you had a file and you inserted that file. And now you make a new torrent where you insert that file again and you share it. So what BitTorrent will do actually is it will just download the same file twice because it's stupid, because it's very simple. And that's fine, it's, it's meant for something else. Um, but I mean, it kind of sounds like we don't ha really have to do that. So how can we avoid doing it? Uh, and it's actually really, really simple. So let's say you have a file, and I decided to call my file my file of data because data is super agnostic, and you can just picture what it should be in your head. Could be a video, could be a big CSV file or a text file. Um, it doesn't really matter. And we ran run that through the chunker I talked about earlier. Uh, and in this example, it produces four chunks, right? So what we can do now is we can just loop through all these chunks and we can just hash them using a hash function. And I hope you know what a hash function is. If not, it's just a way of kind of creating a small fingerprint of a file. Um, so you run through all the chunks, you hash them, and that gives you kind of like a key. And you now just make this hash point to the specific chunk uh, in something similar to a hash table. Right? So why would you do that? It just seems like uh, more work uh, and no gain. Well, it's really smart because now if you do a copy of the file and it contains the same data, it will produce the same hashes, right? Because our chunking strategy is based on content, um, which means that um, if you know the hashes up front, 
then you know that you're going to download the same file, and you'll just read that other file you downloaded earlier instead of actually downloading it from the internet. Um, so that's really, really cool. Also, there's this really cool feature. Um, even if the file has changed, if we edit it, there's a good chance that some of the hashes will be the same. So we will get something called partial deduplication, um, which is pretty awesome also. Um, so even if you update the file, you only download whatever you're, needing, uh, you're missing if you downloaded the previous version. And this is my last technical slide, so bear with me. I just like to pretend I'm smart. Um, I'm not. So, I mean, you can get, these hashes can be quite large. Like, you can have a lot of hashes. If you're chunking uh, with a 20 kilobyte chunk size around that, you'll get the file size divided by 20 kilobyte number of chunks, so that's a lot. So what you can do, instead of sharing all these hashes up front, you can just apply recursion to it. So you can just take every other hash and hash them together, and it gives you a new hash list that's now half as big, because it's every other hash. And you can just apply recursion again, and take every other one of these until you get just one hash. And this one hash now deduplicates the entire file, because this one hash identifies the entire file. So if somebody sent you this hash, you can just check, do I have that already? If I do, then cool, I have the file. If not, I'll just get the next two hashes, and I'll check, do I have one of them? Cool, then I have half the file, I don't need to fetch that. If I, if I don't, I'll continue downwards, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very powerful technique, and I didn't invent it. It was invented in the 70s. It's basically called a Merkle tree. I usually have a pretty cool slide with an Angular and Merkle here and a tree, but I couldn't find a good picture of Angular and Merkle yesterday. And also, this is France, and yeah, I, don't, I didn't even know how to deal with that. But. So, yes, I basically said that already. So if you get the top hash, you can you know, see if um, you have the entire file. If not, you can just get the next ones, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the theory. Hope you're all still awake. Uh, I just wanted to, once my demo in a, middle, in a moment will fail horribly, I just wanted to make sure that you at least try to learn something. Uh, also, fun fact, the only JavaScript I've shown has been the Git example so far. A friend pointed that out to me when I showed him my slides. And this is a JavaScript conference, so it's also pretty cool. Anyways, so live demos. So this is updated, right? Cool. So I made this cool website yesterday, or two days ago, both to kind of show a demo of what I'm doing and also to show off my really impressive front-end skills. So like I said, my file system, my file, uh, file network hopefully works in the browser and in Node. Uh, so in, in browser, it just uses WebRTC, and in Node, it just uses whatever transport is available, TCP or UDP or whatever. Uh, so what you can do is you can uh, add some files. So I have a file here. Hello, Paris. Oh, Paris, I guess. Silent S is very confusing. So what you can do is you can just drag and drop a file onto this. And it will build that Merkle tree. And this hash that it's putting here is actually the top Merkle tree. And it also says that it's in English, and I want to translate it into French, but I don't want to do that. So what I can do now is I can send this to a friend's computer. I'm just going to use the same computer now because it's easier. And or if you're good at remembering, you can just remember the, this hash and type in this URL on your, uh, on your uh, local Chromebook. And I'll actually connect the two browsers using WebRTC and exchange the top hashes to just get the metadata. And I can do stuff like click here and read data. So that's, that's pretty cool. But I mean, there are more efficient ways of sharing uh, hello Paris uh, than sending a hash. Actually, the hash here is longer than the content. So that's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, so let's try something more fun. I have here a CSV file. Let's take that one. And I have a picture of myself here because I'm a narcissist. So let's take that one also. So it works on multiple files also. So you can share that link. Again, if you can remember it, you can try it on your own computer. And I can click the link. And it'll download it, and I can click this CSV file. And this is actually real time based. This is actually going over, over the internet now. It's just really fast internet here. So it's, it's real time. So it'll only fetch what it needs. So when you load something like a CSV file, 
you can uh, just load more and more of it. You can get like a quick uh, preview. Um, so that's all good. Um, just gonna do a hack here real quick because I found out I had an issue earlier. Cool. So we can share CSV files, we can share any kind of files. Uh, so the final demo I'll try to attempt is something a bit more fun than that. Uh, CSV files are really good for data though, and you can even you can share like a two gigabyte CSV file in here and still read the contents. I'm just gonna try that um, really quickly. So actually, I don't have that much time left. I'll just go straight to the thing you want to see. I'm going to share a video. Uh, so when you share something that's big, because this browser is kind of small, it actually takes a while to build this uh, Merkle tree. So I decided to print that out in the terminal, so in the console. So that's what's printing out here. Because the video file here is 200 megabytes, uh, and the browser can only sustain around five, 10 megabytes per second right now because there's a small bottleneck in there, but it's still pretty good. I mean, it's still all right. So it's actually going through this 200 megabyte file now and building that Merkle tree. And I don't know if you can see this number, but it says 13 now, and once that gets to around 20, we'll probably be fine because it's uh, 100 and something megabytes and divided by five megabytes, it's around 20. Hopefully, otherwise I'm gonna look pretty stupid. But it's all right also. So. Cool, we got a hash, and if I paste this in here, I can now click the video, and it'll start streaming the video right away, so it'll only fetch, again, it'll only fetch what it needs, and it'll start uh, playing it, hopefully. So I just made it download slower, and that gives more power to the CPU. So we can actually stream video using this, and we can do random access of video. So I can even do stuff like jumping into the video, and that still works, too. even though it's all based in the browser, and it's, uh, it would also work from Node. Uh, and since we're using these uh, content-defined Merkle trees, if I update this video, it will only share a small diff. That's actually the difference between the old video and the new video. And it only needs to fetch around 20 kilobytes to verify content, so skipping is usually really fast, even though this is not optimized at all. Oh, I should never, should never skip twice, I guess. Thank you. It's on NPM.